In 2014, Cellar Angels introduced to fine wine lovers everywhere, George Noble and Noble Wines. His aging process, extremely unique for a new world producer, where he ages the wine six years prior to release, is what we're discussing tonight in detail and also some pretty special vineyard sources. Sit back, relax, sip episode 97 is here. This is where we need to have music. Chris R. Chris R. is a new name. Julie, I see you. Julie is very, very fast on the trivia questions. Just wrong. So fast. Was the fastest entry this past week. Alyssa, how are you? Doug R. Good to see you. Jane J. Uh, in Denver. Monica. I can't say Larry's last name. I almost did. And it even says out of my notes right here. No last names. Jan K, IVP, Hans and Caitlin. That's a couple. I can I know their last name. Chris P. Bruce, good to see you. Alyssa, I may have said hello to you. Jim Bocci is his new adopted last name. Uh, he knows who we're talking about. Uh, this is SIP episode 97. And fun fact, during the brief rehearsal a few minutes ago, we were learning that George was also on SIP episode 11. So a year and a half or so ago, he was kind enough to share with us everything about Noble. We're going to get back into that this evening. We're going to talk specifically about decanting and aging wine, because I don't know many people in Napa Valley that do it as well as George. And I will continue to say hello to Eric, Delia. Wow, good crowd. Peter G, Nick, Monica, Larry, Julie, Jim, Jeff, Jan, two Jans. All right, let's get into it now. So my name is Martin Cody. We've got a jam-packed show this evening of content, hilarity, knowledge, uh, and socializing. So as I said, at the top of the hour, George Noble is going to be our guest. But before we get into George, a lot of folks, I want to let you know that we may have some technical difficulties because it is a wicked storm right now here in Florida. And we put a camera outside to show some of the wind and it's, let's see if we can get camera two up. It is not nice out there. So that's that's all we have for camera two. So hopefully no one recognized that from a trademark possibility. Uh, but all of you, SIP 97, this is Cellar Angels, SIP educational series. Cellar Angels, a direct-to-consumer wine company specializing exclusively in Napa and Sonoma wines that most often you can't get in your local wine store, often only available via the winery's mailing list. And we have one such example this evening. Many of you are drinking the Noble Wine, the 2015 Cabernet that is available on the website right now. There is only four cases remaining in stock. This is George's current release. The 16 is not out because he ages his wine for an impressive minimum of six years. Uh, this is coming from Hennessy Ridge. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the sourcing vineyards that George has, what's special about them, why he loves them, but you don't want to hear me talk about it. You want to hear George talk about it. So without further ado, tonight's guest on SIP episode 97 is none other than Mr. George Noble. Cheers, sir. Martin, thank you. And uh, I don't know if I can be as nice or as intelligent as you say, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be honest. So uh, that counts for something, I hope. It, it does. It absolutely does. So I can't remember when you and I first came across each other, it had to be 2013, 2014. And you may have actually reached out to the Cellar Angels website, at the about a winery section or info for wineries and filled out something online. And your story was just so tailor made for Cellar Angels, because as you know, and many of the Sipsters know, hello, Debbie, uh, we feature and cater to a fairly sophisticated wine enthusiast, but we do it in a manner where we're showcasing the limited production micro boutique wineries that aren't producing 5,000 cases or 10,000 cases. So that was one of the elements that immediately attracted us to you. But the other one was the aging of your wines that you do prior to release. And I would like you to educate uh, the audience on where you came up with that idea and, and why you decided to, to go ahead and embark upon that. Well, I guess I, before I was a vintner, and the definition of a vintner is somebody who tries to make their living in the wine business. Uh, so meaning I'm uh, not a winemaker, uh, but a, I try to be a vintner. 
and uh, I was a wine collector. And uh, I started collecting wines. And luckily, I started in, two, in 1987, right in that area. And I had a food and beverage background at one time. My father was a chef and so forth. And I worked in the restaurant business for a while. And I picked up some really, I, was, I actually picked up some BR cone that was 84. It was made by Helen Turley. It was one of her first gigs. Wow. Made. And that just aged phenomenal. Most, to me, 1985 was the year I was buying a lot of wines, was to me one of the best worldwide wine years ever. I mean, it was good in France, it was good in Italy, it was good in uh, Australia, good in the United States. And these wines kept getting better in my basement. So I did make some mistakes though. I bought some wines that people would tell me, oh, it's gonna be good in 10 years. And I'd wait 10 years and it wasn't any better than it was when I tasted <laughs> it. So I think you have to have somewhat of a balanced wine to begin with. I'm not saying it's gonna be perfect, but you need a certain balance to begin with because as your tannins fade, your fruit fades too. So it's not like you can totally depend on one going away and the other one coming up. It's, it's you need somewhat of a balanced wine to begin with. Um, but I, so I started making wines actually in 2003 and I never even released the 2003. And I was about ready to roll out my wines in 2007 and eight. And of course, you know what happened with the economy in 2007, right. 2008, went very south. And as I approached all these people to buy my wines, they said, well, we're, we're not looking for new wines unless you want to sell it to us at $20 a bottle. And I knew my wines were good, but I said, no, I mean, my wines, I mean, they've got hillside fruit in them. They're, you know, they're just starting to taste good. And so as I argue with those people, I just sat on it for two or three more years. And finally, they really started to take a good. And by that time, the market in 2010 was starting to come back. So I went out there and I just, it was got to be a habit because Dave Latin and I kind of tailored a way of making our wines where they weren't very accessible up front, but they were good, but they got better with age and they're Primarily, we tried to make a food wine, but what we did was we didn't over oak. A lot of people use 100% new French oak or, you know, I mean, some people literally change their wine barrels, you know, with American oak twice before they release it. So they're throwing all right. this oak influence on it in the beginning. To me, that doesn't help you long term. It gets you a good first kick and it gets you out of the out of the warehouse so to speak but because I think you've forced it into something that's not as natural it doesn't last as long so what we did is we did 50 percent new French oak 50 percent neutral barrels and then we'd age it for two years in the barrel but you know two two and a half in the barrel and then we'd keep in the you know, the bottle in the warehouse for another two and a half years. And that seemed to be the right blend for the hillside fruit I was putting in my wines. And uh, well, and, it's, and it's interesting because you mentioned you were trying to make a living as a vigneron. And in order to do that, you actually have to release wine. You have to get it into the marketplace. You have to sell it or you have cash. My wife like a reminds summer. me of that all the time. <laughs> or you have a cash crop like a Sauvignon Blanc, which you do not right. have. Correct. So, um, uh, school of hard knocks. I was a little naive. I went in as this will be fun. I'll make and again. You, I think you uh, coined the phrase uh, micro boutique at my sitting right where you're sitting right now. You know, and, and tell everybody that's that's my backyard until 2018 when I sold the property. But uh, what you're looking at behind Martin is my backyard, and that's. Uh, over his right shoulder is Chapelet, and over his left shoulder is Colgan. And uh, my vineyard was uh, higher than those. You know, I used to say I looked down at Richard Hill, but uh, and we're gonna 
uh, Mission Control is going to throw in a link to the Noble video that George and I filmed in 2014. And please watch that later because uh, A, I'm wearing the same shirt. So that <laughs> gives you an idea of how horrible my wardrobe is. Uh, <laughs> or, or it is the Pareto principle. You know, I wear 20% of my clothes 80% of the time type of thing. So, uh, but you get it. We did some drone footage up there and we're going to talk a little bit about Pritchard Hill because you decided to age your wine for six years uh, prior to release. Part of it was market conditions. Cause like you said, when you're trying to move the 04 and, and 07 and 08, you know, the market had crashed. And so that was a very tough economic situation. Folks weren't buying, but then as you start releasing the 04 in 2010, as the market's rebounding and it has aged six years, it has, as you mentioned, some of the tannins have fallen off and it's a little bit softer. The fruit is still there. And it wasn't your first time having tasted aged wine. I, I know there's a story in your background about uh, Heights Vineyard. Right. And tell me a little bit about that. Okay, that was uh, my mother-in-law, a uh, Christmas present. She, uh, we'd moved into a new house and this new house, I'd built an area I was gonna build a wine cellar in and I just hadn't gotten around to it. We had a lock on it, so we hide the kids' Christmas presents in there, kind of. And uh, she bought me some uh, Heights uh, Bella Oaks, 1977, and just left it down there. Kind of, I was playing a lot of tennis and sailing, drinking a lot of beer, and doing those type of things. And so one cool Chicago winter. We uh, had some friends over, some flank steak, and I said, I'm going to look at a bottle of wine. And this was about six or this was probably 1983, four, right in there. And it, the, it was great. It just, the balance between the steak we were having and the flank steak we were having that night and the red wine, and it, that was kind of the key to me getting back into the wines. Interesting. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of what makes a wine ageable and age worthy. But I do want to talk about this hill behind me. And, and you'll see it when you watch the video after we get done this evening of George and I at his property. Uh, Pritchard Hill is a pretty special place. Uh, we talk often about wine being or great wines being made in the vineyard. And we, you know, Napa and Sonoma, it's, it's all about the soil and the dirt. Uh, and Ben Hogan famously coined the phrase, the answer's in the dirt. And he was actually talking about the driving range and just pounding balls. But the answer is in the dirt in Napa and Sonoma. And Pritchard Hill is no exception. And there are some neighbors of George. You heard him mention a few of them. Chapelet, Colgin is up there. Bryant Family is up there. Ovid is up there. David Arthur is up there. Tim and Davi's Continuum is up there. All of these wines all of them are literally right over my shoulder and we'll show them a little bit in Google earth, but they're all 150 to $575 a bottle. And, and George not only ages his wine six years or so before release, it's continually at $80 a bottle. So it is, we've been in this business a long time and I don't think I've ever seen Pritchard Hill fruit for $80 a bottle. It just doesn't happen. And it's, I don't know if it's a, again, another vineyard on mistake where you should be charging $250 a bottle and releasing it right away. But boy, uh, we're all the, the benefactors of that. So thank you for that. Well, and I think there's about four years we were Pritchard Hill by then, then right where you're sitting, there was a two acre spread and I'm going to call it lack of dirt. Uh, <laughs> what happens on a ridge line is as all the elements hit, uh, the soil goes down to the valleys. So literally, it was a challenge. The top of the ridge line, we'd have to water twice as much as the bottom because it would dry out so much quicker for between the wind and the sun. Because you get sun all day, you get wind all day. We did get a nice cool breeze off of Lake Hennessy there. So that was one of the things that was nice about being in our location. Uh, the white, it, the grapes like the afternoon cooling, let's call it. You know, they get up to a nice morning sun bath and then a nice cool breeze up the hill and then nice kind of warm evening. 
And the 2015, Peter has a question, the 2015 that most of us are drinking, some of those folks with the sellers that you've been sending us wonderful pictures of, thank you for SIP episode 100 in a few weeks. The, the 2015 is what most of us are drinking. And I've had ours open for about 50 minutes and Peter has had his open for two hours and it's starting to open up now. What, George, in your experience is a good decanting time on the 15? Um, here's where we get into personal preferences and it's, it depends on what you like. And, you know, that's, that's why you should always have two bottles. When you buy, a, if a wine's good enough to buy a bottle, you should buy at least two because yep. you want to see that bottle develop. You want to know how it, and one of the things I have on one of my wine glasses is a little glass cover. And that's kind of my, going to be my neutral. So I'm going to watch the difference my two glasses uh, breathe, so to speak. And one's in a small decanter. I tasted my wine first. And I said, okay, I don't think the tannins are really big. So I went with a little medium decanter and I should have the top out. And I've only been open for an hour, hour and a half, but I can really taste the difference between the one that's been open for an hour, hour and a half. Um, so I don't think there's a rule. You have to be a little careful on older wines not to over oxidize them, over expose them. Um, so that's why I think, you know, you can use, on a newer wine, you can use a big flat decanter where you get a lot of surface area. And then you can go down to a smaller one or even smaller. Yeah, and here's the one I like because it always comes back to you. As you see, there's no bottom on it. So <laughs> never, who's ever got the base is in power. Um, exactly. So when you got friends that don't pass it back, you need a decanter like that. Um, so, you know, I don't know if there's, a, there's not a hard rule on it. Big trouble is though, if you go too far, you can't come back. Right. And That's a good point. Uh, you know, some of my old, the fours, I'm starting to notice that, you know, I probably don't want, they're really pretty good right out of the bottle or only a half an hour kind of thing. And then, uh, so, but the five still taste like a good Bordeaux almost. Um, it's one of my, favorite wines right now and uh and and bill has chimed in on a comment that based upon your theory of buying two of something should they should people buy two cases of the special vertical offer we're going to talk about because that way they can taste them side by side i think it's a good idea i actually used to know a wine professional who advocated buying three cases of a wine one to age one to hold and one to gift or one to drink rather so i thought that was a pretty good methodology now we talked pritchard hill but you also have had over the years some incredible vineyard sources. You've been in the valley a long time. What is it about a particular vineyard that resonates with you where you say, I, I want to get food off that property? And then are you picturing something in the back of your mind that you know six years henceforth? Or tell me, tell us about the methodology because you've picked some amazing vineyards. Um, I think it's knowing the grower. Okay. You talk to the grower and you ask them about how much fruit he's going to drop and you know you know he's going to keep you know on a good strong shoot you can keep two and a weaker shoot you only keep one cluster um I'd like say a strong shoot you can keep two but you got to get somebody that's going to drop those grapes on those weaker shoots to get the energy into what grapes you're leaving on so it's about their willingness to farm it the way you want it farmed. Um, and then a little bit about location. And part of the things about location though, it's a little bit of a one year east side of the valley is great. I mean, there's 20 some microclimates in Napa Valley. Right. So you can, and it's about the way the guy farms in the conditions he's given. There's probably way more decisions made in the vineyard than there is in the winery. Hmm. Uh, well, and it gets down to, we talk about it often, farm the table has been a great movement for the last 25 to 30 years. And now it's starting to trickle over into wine where people want to know the grower. They right. want to know who the farmer is and you aren't going to get that in mass produced wines. So no. uh, Kyle N, hello, Mark L, hello. Uh, I love the 
the aspect too that you kind of it seems have stayed away from valley floor fruit in favor of hillside or higher elevation fruit. What's your reasoning behind that? Um, more tannins, and I think it goes with the style of wine I, I bring to the table. Uh, the valley floor, I mean, you, it's not bad to have some valley floor to mix with it maybe, but I wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, the 2003 that I never released was a good wine, but it didn't compare with the, my fours and beyond because starting in four, five, six, and seven, I was mixing in Pritchard Hill fruit with and the hillside fruits. And mm -hmm. uh, so and you only get one chance at your name in a winery. If the first year is a bad year, you might as well, you know, sell it to somebody and let them battle it, you know? So um, that's a good point. Was there any, what was the decision by putting your name on the bottle? Something my father left me. Uh, you know, it's a good name. It, you know, I don't know if anybody's read the back of the bottle, but uh, that's off uh, straight off a of 1917 Webster's Dictionary, those first uh, sentence. Uh, yeah. So I. Uh, and noble, an adjective possessing very high or excellent qualities or properties. Like I say, so, if you look at a 1917 Webster's Dictionary, that's what it says. So I thought just that because was... my shirt's that old doesn't mean I have a dictionary from that far ago. <laughs> I, I might. I, and a lot of people don't have dictionaries today. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, good question on the difference between aerating and decanting. Because I remember when we owned the wine shop, we did sell quite a few aerators. And what is the difference in your opinion? And then we can espouse ours on the difference between aerating and decanting? Oh, I think the aerator beats up the wine a little. I mean, it's not as, I guess we've done everything long and slow. <laughs> you know, we haven't added oak in a lot of things. We've let it naturally, you know, it imparts its flavors slowly. And I think an aerator just, you know, you get bubbles and, you know, I mean, it, it, it works on some wines. Again, I don't think you need to do that on an older wine. If you're drinking something that was bottled yesterday, it might not be a bad idea. But uh, for higher quality wines, I don't, you know, uh, I don't think you need, need to use a narrator. Just, you know. Yeah. And, and I agree with you, Jan, when we were given in-service after in-service, on aerators. Aerators are an accelerated model of oxidation. Whereas to George's point, sometimes that acceleration actually beats up the wine. It's almost like a propeller going through the water. Uh, whereas on the decanting side, it's a little bit softer. The wine oxidizes more gradually. It's probably a personal preference type of thing. And it's interesting because last week we had Cliff family on and their Cabernet was screw capped because they wanted people to not age the wine. It was, it was just meant to drink earlier. And I do agree with Doug that that one probably could have benefited from a little decanting because it was out of the gates big. And I think it needed to just soften a tad and that would have probably benefited from a half hour of hang time. Uh, Bill has a question as it relates to the winemaker knowing best or the winery owner knowing best and because it is your art. And so with, 12 plus vintages or so, what is the average age an optimal age for you, George, to enjoy your wines? I think it's around, again, each wine's a little different. I'm probably around the eight year guy. The eight year okay. I think is, you know, between seven and 10 is probably the sweet spot on most of my wines. Um, but somewhere seven, eight right in there. Perfect. And then speaking of uh, questions, and we're talking about aging wine, here's the first poll question for this evening. And so for those of you that are new, there is a tremendous amount of money that people wager on these. And we have yet to pay anybody because no one's gotten them all correct for 97 episodes. So the house always wins. Uh, but the first question, what percent of wine in the world, global wine production, what percent is meant for aging? 1%, 7%, 10% or 14%? George, you can't answer. I can't answer. Okay, never mind. No. 
So for those of you that have already answered, it's wine time. <laughs> All right, we're going to give this five, four, three, two, one. Do you have a guess, George? It's either, I, I, I don't think it's seven, but it's hard to believe it's down to one. Most people have said one, and in fact, it is 1%. I've seen a couple different statistics. The one statistic I see most often is 1%. I've yet to see anything above 5%, but it's usually anywhere between one to 3% of the world's wine is meant for aging. And 90% of the world produced wine is meant for consumption within you know, the first month or two after purchase. I mean, it is designed to be consumed. Second question, for those of you that guessed seven, 10 and 14, and there are 15 of you, you there's a little redemption here. Which wine or varietal has the greatest aging potential? Cabernet Sauvignon, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese. And the Sangiovese one is interesting because we have a fantastic Italian vintner coming up in Milia Vaca, one of the founders of Napa, fifth generation Napian. <laughs> Doug, I like it. My wife asserts that all 1% is in my basement of the wine that needs to be aged. <laughs> uh, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. The Sipsters, they are nailing it this evening. The correct answer is Nebbiolo. And it is probably one of the most, it is the most age worthy wines, often beyond 40 years. And interesting, and Georgia and I are going to talk about this because it relates to structure. And there are four components of structure and George mentioned some of them earlier. You've got tannin, you've got alcohol, you've got acidity and you've got sugars. And you have to have all four of those. And you normally want high tannin and high acid because over time those will soften. And, and, and George mentioned it earlier and I totally agree. Just because you have those doesn't mean you have an age worthy wine. Uh, if the acid is high and the alcohol is super high, probably not good. If you look at some of the, the age-worthy Rieslings around the world, those Rieslings are 10 and 11% alcohol, and they're 30, 40 years of age in the Moselle. And by the way, the opposite is true as it relates to fortified wines like ports. They, they will be high in alcohol. So George, you mentioned some of the places that you source your fruit from the hillsides, and you specifically said because of the tannin. So, so what does tannin mean to you as it relates to kind of the, the feel in your mouth and when you taste it in the grape, uh, you know that this is an age-worthy wine? Um, I guess when, it's hot, when I'm tasting a grape in the field, let me kind of, let me kind of not answer your question. <laughs> when I'm tasting a grape in the field, I, I would bite into the grape and chew the seed, the what's ever inside the grape, all the seeds and so forth. I was looking for a woody, almost a pleasant taste, not where it was, I didn't want to taste tannins, I wanted to taste a nice woody, smooth feeling on that grape. And consequently, my wines are high alcohol wines. My wines are not supposed to age. I mean, we're at 15% and most of my wines are more. Um, but I, I think it's again, the way we handle the oak and the aging that makes the difference. Um, and the acid helps. Yes. Um, and Dave Latin helped a lot. And know. Dave Latin helped a yeah. lot as well. Perfect. Um, Bruce has a question. As it relates to your wine specifically, do you filter or are the wines unfined? They're what we used to call cross flow filters, where they literally pump the wine against each other and somehow the sediment falls out. So it's not like driving them through a pad. Uh, it's a kinder, gentler way of filtering your wine, I guess. They use it a lot for Pinots, because Pinots are traditionally kind of dirty wines. And if you try to filter them, through a, a press filter, they'll fog up the filters. It's just really, it, it's hard, hard to, I'm changing subject. It's hard to filter a Pinot unless you use cross flow. 
but it seems to work good for Cabernet too. And so there's no like egg white finding or anything like that. It's just a cross flow filtration. Correct. And so will people still get sediment in your wines? Some. Some. Um, again, it's it's not like an unfiltered on your most of your unfiltered wine. I mean, it's and I can't really figure that out because even in some of the filtered wines, you'll get sediment. And right. the sediment is far bigger than filter spacing. So <laughs> you know it's developing in the bottle. Right. And so some that, of the polyphenols and the long chain proteins are, can, you know, globbing onto each other. And, right. and it's there you have it. Mainly the yeast factor, I think, that's left in your wine, uh, even though it's filtered and so forth. All right, I have one more poll question before we go to the cameras for those of you that are Zoom ready. This is a WSET level three advanced question. And I didn't take the exam, I just stole the question. Which of the following is not a structural compound that makes up the body of the wine? Color, tannin, alcohol, acidity. Everyone's like, hey, Friday night wine event. I did not That's know there was going to be one. trivia questions. <laughs> we have arguably the smartest audience in wine nation. <laughs> it's just unbelievable how good these people are week in and week out. That's why they call them sipsters. They are modern day wine heroes. The answer is color. Color does not make up a compound for body and wine. Good job, everyone. Pat yourself on the back, have a glass of wine. Uh, Mission Control is going to elevate folks to panelists should they want to be on camera. I'm gonna continue talking with George and, and not just Cabernet that you produce, but some other very decadent red wines. W walk us through the portfolio. Well, we did uh, some Petite Syrahs for a while. And actually, and why? Um, Clay Shannon. I don't know. Oh, okay. Clay? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, great guy and has some great vineyards and their hillside. Very, like, it used to be a volcano there. You can tell it's when it rains there, all those, it just goes right through the soil. So I, I loved his farming, I loved his vineyards. And so uh, we did Petit Syrahs for four years. And I kind of got discouraged after about five or six years. I didn't think the Petit Syrahs were tasting that well. But 10 years later, I go, wow, it just it has taken that much time for them to really come around. So. Uh, uh, you know, I kind of wish I'd stayed at it now, but, uh, you know, so, and I guess at my age, uh, how long do I want to keep something in the bottle before I, as you say, eventually <laughs> you need to sell it, you know? Uh, that's true. We can't all take it with us. Doug, hint, hint, send some of that stuff that 1% out. Uh, out of curiosity, what is overall case production for, say, everything that you made in 2015? Um, it's on the bottle. It's about... I think I did 160 cases or something like that. Could have answered that. 128 cases. Okay. I, and that was a year that it was one of those difficult years. We didn't get much fruit. So that's all we made. That, and that was from my property that you're, that's behind you or that you're sitting on my property, so to speak. And that was the trouble with the two acres. Uh, you didn't always get a lot of, uh, depending on the year, you, you know, I think the most I got out of there was 225 cases on the hillside. Where down so the wall, in the valley floor, you that might be 400, 500 cases out of two acres. So what happens, I, I know that you produced a Petit Syrah and, and Clay was instrumental in that. But if we talk about aging Petit Syrah versus aging Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I, you know, the, if you look at the skin, it's just a thick, hearty grape in a Petit Syrah. And that's where the tannins are in the skin of a grape. So uh, that's why you cold soak them and leave the, 
the grapes in, in the winemaking procedure for, you know, we cold soak for three days before we, three to four days before we start the fermentation process. Usually by the fourth day, the, you get what you call a house yeast. Uh, usually the first time you make a wine that becomes your winery's house yeast, it kind of lives in the winery. I don't care how clean your winery is. And so it becomes naturally starts to fermentate. And you want to add the yeast you like at that point. Some of the time you need to get a yeast that's going to handle higher alcohol than there are certain varieties of yeast out there. Uh, just like the rootstock on the Cabernet, there's different rootstock and so forth. Um, so what's the, there's got to be a marketing phrase for house yeast, because I don't think a marketing person or an ad person would ever let you say, oh, it's our own house yeast. Well, I, I think they call that, that naturally, you know, what they call it, <laughs> naturally occurring yeast or something to that effect. Naturally occurring yeast in our own cellar here. I like it. You know, so, but I mean, some people let our literally let, let the yeast, the grapes just develop slowly, but you, you lose a little control that way. And to be honest with you, it still is a business. You, you get a tank started and it might take, usually it's in the tank. I would say we average probably about 10 days in the tank before we went to 10 to 12 days before we went to barrels, cold soak for three, started the fermentation process. Uh, then barreled it, you know, did, and, and if you don't, uh, there's a risk if you let the yeast just do its own thing of that tank could take three weeks, four weeks. And so at a certain point, the winery wants to clear their tanks too. They, they've got more grapes coming in. So they're, they're, that's the business side of it. You have to, at certain points, you have to say, okay, I, I only own this tank for 10 days or 15 days. Right. And, and the winery's got to pay some bills. Exactly. Exactly. So when you're aging Cabernet, what is, what are the benefits in your opinion of aging a Cabernet? Well, I think, I guess I'm one of the, I never thought I'd be a one percenter, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's the way I make my wines, they're made to be aged, I guess. And so, uh, and I'm doing the aging instead of, you know, you putting it in your cellar. Um, I think you get to buy the wines closer to where they're gonna taste at their best. Uh, whether you're buying a wine that's on a two year cycle or a three year cycle, there's still gonna be a lot of change in that wine whether you're buying a wine at the end of a six years, you pretty much know what it's gonna taste like. Uh, so it, it's, it's helping the consumer taking a bottle of wine home that they're gonna be happy with. I lost your sound, Martin. Check one, two, check one, two. When we talked about it earlier, the structure of the wine, the four elements of aging, the acid in the wine, the alcohol in the wine, the sugars and the tannin. When you look at some of the special places around Napa, uh, Howell Mountain, for example, usually produces wines with significant tannin. And some of those wines up there, uh, Randy Dunn's wines, for example, age 10, 15 years because they have so much tannin. So as you're aging your red wine, some of those tannins soften and fall out. But to your point earlier, George, you risk the point of the acid off also falling off. And they don't all, these things don't settle equally. So you need that balance. And I, I like the question and the answer of the magic being about seven to 10 years for your wines, because you've aged them six already. So six to seven in some years. So that I think is unheard of. Very old world. You know, they do that in Spain a lot with the Grand Reservas. And those are aged six years, but uh, that's impressive. And, and the, some of these wines are now just coming into their own. And you can see the color, unlike white wines, when you age white wines, they get darker. Red wines actually get lighter. They, they go from, you, you look at the wine from the center of the glass out, 
And as it gets closer to the edge, it'll turn brickish red, orange. And that's how you can tell a little bit of the age on the wine. Uh, but the sediment and the tannins can fall off and then you just have that silky softness. So uh, if anybody's it, drinking the 15, they could, if they had a white background, they can look at the wine and there's no, there's no brown circle yet. Usually when you know that's fine, that's getting long, so to speak. And it, you know, it's, uh, you'll see a brown circle around the edge of the wine. That means the aging is probably not going to last much longer. No, and, and, and Doug, I agree. There's any time you're at a restaurant and you're looking for an aged wine, unfortunately, they, they don't give you the price that they should give you. They mark it up because it is aged. And nor, normally they haven't aged it. It's been aged somewhere else and they've acquired it. Well, they've uh, probably but, acquired that at auction or, you know, yep. some of them, you know, I've got a few restaurants that buy wine from me, but the pandemic hurt a lot of independent restaurants out there. And that was the kind of restaurants that I was dealing with. The, small independent people. So well, I do want to show you can, folks go to those small restaurants. Absolutely. So they, need, the small they need your help still. So I tell people that we focus on the small limited production wineries. And I know this is everybody's favorite segment of the show, the Google Earth segment, where we get to show the property behind me that I literally was white knuckled driving to. And uh, I also encountered, I think it was California highway construction, large truck on a very, very small road. So thankfully I had the right of way. Uh, but for those of you that are new to Cellar Angels, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Napa and Sonoma only, this is our focus. So our wine region is right in here. And if you look at Napa County and you look at Sonoma County, they are essentially some of the greatest soils in the world for wine production. Not essentially, it's, it's arguably they are, which is why they're not so expensive. Uh, but we, we talk often about the, the different types of microclimates. George mentioned that Napa has 20 different microclimates. They've got 33 different soil structures and series. It, it's just incredible what they have from a tapestry or a canvas with which to create great wines. And I do wanna show where Pritchard Hill is. Now, Pritchard Hill is not an AVA. It is, it's a hill. It, it's a combination of different areas. Its boundaries are very nondescript. And so I said, this is Pritchard Hill-ish. I didn't walk it off with a meter stick or anything like that, but uh, this is where it largely resides. This is Lake Hennessy, which you'll see in the video that Mission Control shared over my shoulder that it's, George and I are looking down on Lake Hennessy. You are up there, um, from a standpoint of elevation. Right feet, which yep. is high in Napa Valley. And to give you an idea, this is Stagecoach. So, so you can see exactly how close Pritchard Hill and Stagecoach are, uh, which, which I think it looks like two constellations. And from a wine standpoint, they're two of the greatest constellations. But George mentioned that he sold his residence in 2018. And this is where his residence was. Right? Right there so right on top of Pritchard Hill or in that vicinity and looking over at Chapelet and the other wineries and Colado is right up the road here right over here and it's just you can see Napa Valley down in here and if, if I pull back you get an idea of exactly where they're located Here's Lake Hennessy, here's Oakville, Rutherford, Zinfandel, St. Helena. So you just come basically, in the video I said St. Helena is a stone's throw away. That was back when I had a good arm. This is a pretty good throw. Uh, but you get an idea of just the topography of this is insane. And in the video, George talks about, here's Coletto. George talks about his two acres of vines on the crest of a hill. And so here is his vineyards, his former residence. And you can see there's very little topsoil up here. So it, it has gone around to the edges and this was used mainly for blending. I don't think you ever produced 100% off of this, did you? Um, yes, I did. Oh. Um, I think actually the 15 is 100%. Uh, 
on uh, from from my vendor. Nice. Okay, that explains 128 cases because it's not that large. Correct. Um, and by the way, you mentioned Kletos. I, a little quick background on there. I don't know if you can see there's a little fire road there between our vineyard and Kletos. That's how I would take my grapes over to Kletos. We wouldn't even hit the highway. We made our grapes. At, Dave Latin was at Kletos for a long time, uh, close to 20 years, I think. And uh, we would take our caboodle and the little trailer and uh, shoot the grapes over there. We'd pick them and have them over on his step in about uh, 12 minutes. And uh, he'd start working on them. And we, I'd run back and get another container and shoot them back over. So, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot, it's, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun when you make wine. And especially if you have good, good people and that you work with and so forth. No, I mean, this is a, an amazing place. And like I said, I'm sitting at the patio overlooking the valley from up there. Uh, and you can see, I mean, here's Bryant family, Chapelet's right over here. Uh, they're all in this magical earth continuum, Ovid, minor down on the valley floor. Many people have been there. But when you get up into this elevation, it, it is pretty intense up here. And so the grapes struggle, as we've talked about in the past, mountain fruit always has more intensity to it than valley floor fruit because of that struggle. They've got to dig very deep for nutrient. They've got to big, dig very deep for water. Uh, and that intensity and struggle comes through in the clusters. It comes through in the berries. It, it comes through in the final product in the bottle. The, the ideal aspect of this, George, is that you've aged the wine so we don't have to because we're, we're we're lazy, at least in this household. Um, so I like that. The, the aspect of environment to age wine is, wine in, what, what temperature, what humidity? To me, you know, it'd be nice if we all had a cave, but we don't. Um, I think humidity control or con constant temperature, number one, because if you get a lot of variations, you're gonna force the wine out, force the, the, you know, it's gonna expand and contract and you're gonna suck air in, you're gonna try to push wine out. So consistency, I don't care if it's 65, 70, as long as it says consistent at 70 would, would be the aging point. I mean, it's, you don't want it to be 70 one day and 55 the next. That's no, that is a huge point, George. Thank you for bringing that up. That's, it doesn't, wine can take a heat spike. You know, if you throw it in your car and you're moving it to dinner and all of a sudden you leave it in the car and you don't take it to dinner because someone else brought wine and it was 70 in your car or 75 in your car, it'll be okay if you throw it back in the cellar and go down to 55. It just doesn't like a repeat of that, you know. It's the insulated bag, folks. You all have one. <laughs> I always, I, I literally, I, well, I, of course, that's what I do is I try to sell wine. So I want to present wine in a good shape, but I take my cooler and I'll put a, one of those little Coleman things on top of it, you know, keep my wine, uh, you know, just, you know, keep it a consistent temperature from when I leave my storage area to when I serve it to my guests. And the, the question is often, what wine do I decant? I've got a 2020 red wine. Do I decant that? Do I, I, do I decant white wine? What is your theory on which wines to decant uh, certain ages or what, what, is, what do you practice? Um, I like to decant younger wines because I think they need more air. So, you know, if you want to use your aerator or something like that, that might be the time on a younger wine, an older wine. What I would do is usually when you're drinking an older wine, you know, you're going to drink it. It's usually not a spur of the moment thing. So I go to my cellar or my refrigerator and try to stand it upright. So the sediment would naturally fall to the bottom. So when I go to, okay. power, I watch for the sediment start coming out the bottle and I'd slow down or use a filter or something to that effect. Uh, so, and again, I, I use these little glass tops occasionally 
just to slow down the aging if I'm doing more talking than drinking like tonight. Um, you know. So you're, you're slowing down the aging in the glass. Correct. This is kind of my neutral glass. I poured this glass right out of the bottle and I, and now I can smell the difference in the wines and I, this one smells better and it tastes better, but this one still doesn't smell bad, but it's, it's still tighter. It hasn't opened up as much as this one has. Um, but this, now this has been about two hours now, but this is getting to, I wouldn't want to get it, age it too much more or age it, but oxidize it too much more. And what happens when it gets over oxidized? How will you notice that? It'll get flat. I mean, it, it, I don't know if anybody's ever tasted a wine in the morning just to see what it takes. See if it tastes as good as it did last night. And then not frowned, up, not frowned upon in this household. Yeah, you're nothing left, I know. But uh, anyway, um, it'll just be very flat and just won't have any flavor. And, uh, you know, it'll, it's not enjoyable. No, and it's interesting on some of those older wines, this has happened to us. And, and Doug R., you, you might be familiar with this. A lot of the older French wines, 90s, 80s, and stuff like that. The wine will age, rise and fall literally in front of your eyes. And it, it can happen where it, it just, you smell it in the glass. You're like, oh, this is fantastic. Then all of a sudden it gets a lot of oxygen, George, to your point. You're like, okay, this is not, this is going downhill quickly. Everyone drink up as fast as you can because this is, it's just another reason to speed drink. But oftentimes uh, it's those sorts of things that you realize, okay, we age this way too long. And, and yeah, some of that's taste too. You, you might like your wines a little more tan, a little more acid, a little more fruit, wherever somebody might like them, you know, a little flatter as you would call it, you know, but right. yeah. Not, uh, as, not as fruit it, forward, it, not as vibrant. Wine's very individual. And it, it kind of bothers me when people try to tell people what they should like and so forth. I, I think people have to learn for themselves what they like. But, you know, go to a restaurant, you should know a few key words, you know, number one, I only want to spend from X to X, you know, here's the kind of wine, you know, I like fruit forward, or I like mild tannins, uh, because the people, these restaurants, they want to do a good job. They want to show you they've got some stars in the back room. So uh, if you uh, approach them right, they'll, they'll treat you right. You know, it's interesting. Some of you have never met George until this evening, and you can see his approach is quite unique, quite special. Uh, he has impeccable fruit vineyard sources, has built a great deal of friends in the valley to where he, he knows the growers, and that brings up a great opportunity to have access to great fruit and produce great wine. But one of the other things that I'm thrilled to know about him is, is his giving nature. And, and putting together this evening and putting together kind of an opportunity for everybody to get some access to Noble, he put together what I believe is the vertical offer of the century. And so what George has done for Cellar Angels, and Sipsters are getting first crack at this, is he has put together the ultimate Cabernet Sauvignon vertical. So now what this is, is one bottle each of every vintage since 04. And it's special for a bunch of reasons. A, it's not produced anywhere else in the world. You aren't going to get this at a store or anything like that. But what's really unique about this is that the 2007, which was a blockbuster vintage in Napa, George has been sold out of for quite a few years. So to complete this offer of which only 24, exact, scratch that, now only 21 are available because several were brought earlier this evening. To complete this offer, he dipped into his own personal library and grabbed 24 of the 2007s. So this is on the website right now. As I mentioned, Sipsters are getting first crack at it this evening. There will be an email going out uh, to a percentage of the VIP base tomorrow. So if you are interested in getting one bottle each of the Noble 2004 all the way on up to the 2015, this is your opportunity. It's basically it's, uh, a pretty full case, and uh, I don't think you'll find any losers in there. I think you'll no. be the best, you know, with... And if you... If you order a case, there will be a 15% discount at checkout automatically applied. If you order two cases, there will be a 25% discount at checkout automatically applied. Applied, And the 2011 vintage, George, tell me about the 2011 vintage. 
Well, we made 52 cases and we literally threw, we sold off, not threw out, to, to some, some other winery in Napa, uh, about six barrels of our older wines, of our 11. And uh, we took the two best barrels and we made 52 cases of wine. And it's, I wish I hadn't thrown out the other barrels now the way it tastes now. It's, it's, it's it, it, you know, that's about having all those different microclimates and the different right. areas in Napa. You never know, I mean, the two thirds of Napa might have an okay year and the other third is just dynamite. And- Well, uh, it's, it's interesting too, because the 2011 was a year that was maligned by the wine media as it, and it was, it was a challenging year uh, with regards to weather, with regards to rain, uh, temperatures at harvest. I mean, it was just an up and down year. However, there were a great many wineries that had exceptional fruit that year. Most of those were mountain wineries and they got the degree days of sunshine they needed. And that's George, your winery was, was up, is up there. So I'm curious, I know we mentioned Dave Latin, who was making your wine off and on, you know, after Dave left or before Dave, or was it Dave throughout? Uh, no, uh, Coletto, they had a interim winemaker and then, um, uh, geez, I'm having a senior moment. Then the young man who worked under Dave uh, took it over and he's, he, I'm very happy with the last two years of the wine he made. Uh, so, uh, uh, not your art, uh, Giro someone, is someone Dave knows. Mexican man, and he's got his degree from Davis now. And he, but he worked for Dave, and now he's making wine at Foley Johnson and uh, uh, one of their other uh, properties, uh, one of other Foley properties. Well, Cleto is now owned by Foley. So he's making uh, the wine at Foley's and, and Foley Johnson right there on 29. Any idea with, with the, the vertical, George, how would you segment them to say, okay, one night you should have a whole bunch of sisters over and drink the 04 through 08, and then Debbie could make a charcuterie tray. And then the next night you have like the nine through 14. How would you segment this vertical from a tasting standpoint? Well, I used to do lunch, or I still do lunch with a vintner when you're in Napa Valley. And we go to a restaurant and take, uh, start out with four bottles of wine. And it got to be where all of a sudden there's three of us drinking four bottles of wine. So I <laughs> kind of pared that down to three, three different bottles of wine. I started out with my, originally my four or five, six and seven. We sold a lot of seven. So I decided, well, let's go four or five, six. And now that I've got more variety, I'll usually pick an older wine, a middle wine and quote a newer wine, something like a 12, 14, 15. And so I let people see how the wines taste with the different years. So there's two ways to school. You can either do a group together or kind of do every three years and you know spread them out that way where they get to see an older wine, a middle wine and a newer wine. Uh, and I, I like that because there, there is a romantic aspect about drinking an aged wine. And oftentimes it might be a birth year wine, or it might be, this is the year we got married or that sort of stuff with regards to celebrating an age worthy wine. So when you have an opportunity with the vertical right now, you know, I don't know what was happening in 2004. I, I know I've had the 2004 quite a few times and it's still fantastic. I agree with Jeff. It's really stunning wine, even at 18 years of age. Uh, but also I love the power and finesse and the fruit in the 12. And there's just something about some of the newer wines that you know they're going to be age worthy. They already are. Uh, but doing those side by side, Debbie, to your question, I think would be really fun for an audience to maybe have something aged and then something newer, even though the most recent vintage is the 15 and that's seven years old already. So yeah. it, it's that has age on it. Uh, terrific. It, it's an unbelievable vertical offer. And I hope if you're inclined that you're able to grab it because it's, as I said, it's once in a lifetime. Uh, this recording, and for those of you that were unable to make it, you are watching it 
delayed. So hopefully there is something left. Uh, I can't thank you enough, George. You survived all the technology. You are a, a gentleman and a scholar and just a credit to the wine industry. And for those of you that have been lucky enough to taste with George in Napa, it is a tasting you will not soon forget because it is at a restaurant. He does show up uh, with plenty to drink. You do not go home thirsty. Uh, oftentimes the restaurant has let us know that people just don't go home and uh, we have to figure out a way to curb that. Uh, but we are approaching our 100th sip episode and many of you have sent in pictures of your cellar which we requested and wow do we need to go around a trip around the country and visit some of these cellars because they are magnificent i know a certain someone who is retired and actually has an rv so i'm thinking uh, or they pull an rv they do a little camping they do I, I think there might be a way we can finagle that uh next week we are off because of the Memorial Day weekend. So meet us back here, please, in two weeks, where we'll be discussing some Italian varietals and the age-worthiness of Italian wines uh, with Katie Miliavaca and Vince, her winemaker extraordinaire, and some of the fruit that they source because of some very special relationships. But with that, George, you are free to go enjoy your two glasses of wine and two bottles. Yeah. Tell, I might tell not be anywhere for a few minutes. <laughs> You are wonderful. Sipsters, you guys are the best. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you, everybody. Glad you're Cheers and stay safe, everyone. Be good to one another. Bye-bye.